there. So we continue with uh, our beloved uh, professor <laughs> from Tübingen, Stefan Morent, who will uh, explain you the techniques and the aesthetics of the Gregorian song. Come on. And first of all, before that, uh, Luis will explain you the bridge between ancient Greek music, Byzantine music, and Gregorian song, just to understand. Well, it'll take me 30 seconds, so don't worry. I just want you to think of what we saw during the morning and how the notes had the same names as those I showed you yesterday, like Neti, Hipate, Mese, and so on. And uh, I said to you that the harmonic system had disappeared, but the diatonic and the chromatic just lead ancient Greek music into new Christian music of the past. Then it develops in very uh, complex ways, and uh, well, and uh, that's all I wanted to say. Yeah, only 30 seconds. <laughs> Thank you. I said. <laughs> Thank you. So I'll try to wake up. Okay, hello everyone. From my part, thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, as Anastasia told yesterday, um, it started all with a accidental <laughs> conference <laughs> we did last summer, uh, meeting all the departments of CVs or most of the departments who have music, which have music. And suddenly we discovered that we have something in common and, and we kept in touch and on a sudden we are here. So <laughs> but that's like uh, things happen. So and um, ah, there's something popping up as always. Ah, I could now connect to it uh, now. <laughs> OK. Um, I thought uh, now for my presentation it would be perhaps for you interesting to uh, learn a little more, a little more about what you will be measuring this afternoon, uh, which music will sound, and what you will hear this afternoon in the concert. Uh, as you heard, uh, the, the Scola Cantorum will sing tonight, and Achilleas Choir, and we are looking forward to this combination. Okay. Um, I hope you you followed my first online lecture, or you could follow, where I explained um, the major principles of very short principles uh, of Gregorian chant. And today we will have a look more deeply into that what we will hear tonight or this evening. Um, <coughs> don't worry, I I will keep it uh, now flexible so that we don't run out of time so that you have your break in between <laughs> i don't want to i don't w uh, will um, apply the principles of achilleas he pointed out in Byzantine chant of repetition and elaboration and so on in my talk i will keep it flexible so i thought uh, we start uh, with a very short overview of the main um, liturgical forms, just to give a background for those of you, I don't know how many are here, uh, who might have, it's totally new for some of the people. And, um, well, the, the first uh, structure I wanted to show you is uh, the mass, um, which maybe uh, the most of you might know or have already attended uh, a mass service. And I've put uh, on the slide the two major um, criteria or groups of uh, only the items that are sung. There are no prayers or something that is spoken or recited. I've only concentrated on the pieces that are sung. And we normally uh, group that in the so-called Ordinarium or ordinary, and the proprium. 
uh, which is uh, the ordinary or the ordinarium. ordinarium. Uh, that means um, these are the chants that are always the same in every mass. They are not changed. And the, the proprium, it's, um, these are the items that are specific for every uh, day. It changes. Uh, so if you follow um, the left column, you see, uh, probably you know it, but uh, it starts, the first of these songs is, chance is the Kyrie, Kyrie eleison, we, we heard the Kyrie from Achilleas also, shortly in the lecture. And that's the one of the chants which is still in Greek, in Latin mass service. That's an, uh, a relic of, because until the third, fourth century, also in the Western church, the language was uh, Latin, uh, Greek. Okay, I have to reactivate it until it loses connection. Ah, that's again. How is this pop out? Okay, the second is uh, the Gloria, or also the uh, uh, major doxology, it is also called. Well, that's, can we somehow? Ah, okay. Ich sehe mein Wi-Fi jetzt gar nicht. Hm. Ich das irgendwo hin? Ah, Vollbild, okay. Ja. Ah. Bisschen so, okay, thank you. Um, then we have the Credo uh, and uh, the Sanctus which is imagined uh, to be sung, the, the song which is sung by the angels, and the Agnus Dei. And uh, on the right you see the proprium, and the first of these items is the so-called introitus, introit in English, that is the song that is, uh, the chant that is sung when the clergy comes into the church, and that is always, um, in the text, it is adapted to the feast and the sense of the feast that is celebrated. So it gives an idea of uh, what will be now celebrated. The graduale or gradual, that's uh, the f if we have two lessons um, on major feast days, it is the so-called responsory to the first lesson and, in, and it is an sung response to what we heard before. And then have we have a second lecture, and after that we have the Alleluia. We heard also an Alleluia sung by Achilles. Um, it is replaced by a so-called tractus in Lenten time, because um, Alleluia is not appropriate to sing in Lenten. Uh, there may follow a so-called sequencia, uh, a sequence, which is in its initial uh, origin, it is said that it developed from the last melisma of the Alleluia, maybe by texting the Alleluia. Um, Achilles was talking about this long melisma he could sing over an hour, so <laughs> um, that may be something. Uh, we have in Latin, uh, they call it the longissima melodia, so it's the very, very long melody. So The offertorium, the offertory, and the communio, which is normally sung during communion. So, just to give you a general background, that you won't hear tonight. <laughs> um, it is, I think, uh, more well known than what we see on the next slide, the office. But from the time it takes by singing, the office is far more time, much more time than the mass office. And uh, the monks um, that we are singing, um, that's the next slide, um, in the monasteries uh, which follow the monastic office according to the rule of Benedict of Nursia, 
um, they have those eight hours according to the rule of Benedict. And I've called it the medieval round because uh, it's a circular um, phenomenon. It normally starts with uh, the vigil or the vigilias in Latin or also matins. There are several nomenclatures. I won't go into detail now because that would be a lecture for my music students, um, how it is really structured item per item, but I've only outlined what may be the major items of every of these hours. So, um, well, it starts uh, with vigil. In, in vigil, there is the word of uh, waiting in the night, if you translate it the, the, the uh, by word. I've put in parentheses approximately the time when it starts, but that's only an approximation. So two o'clock in the night, if you, if you are in a monastery, you have been very tough because <laughs> it starts and singing at two o'clock, it's a challenge. Yeah. And then for three hours, because uh, a very solemn vigil and the major feast days lasts, did last three hours. I think there are hardly any monastic orders today who really follow this strict cycle as they did in the Middle Ages. They shortened the office, so. Uh, but even Benedict says in his rule, he is a very human um, uh, creator of rules because he said, the mate, it begins with the so-called uh, invitatorium, which is uh, Psalm 94, which in Latin starts with venite exultemus domino, which means uh, come together, all together, let us praise the Lord. And uh, Benedict takes it uh, by word and he says, that has to be sung very slowly for those who can't wake up very quickly and are late, that they can still join the community. But when the venite is sung and you come late, it's definitely too late. Then you have to come before the convent and confess that you were too late and receive your punishment. Also, if you make a mistake in psalm singing, you have to come before the abbot confess that you have failed and then you will receive the punishment you will get for it. That's much more human. For us it's not human because if you make a wrong note and you get punished. Um, in the Irish rules of St. Columban, for example, you get, you get whipped if you have sung for every wrong note. So. Benedict is much more human <laughs> already. <laughs> um, okay, uh, there is uh, the vigil and there are responsories and so on. Then, uh, it, it, if it's a feast day, it immediately is joined after three hours at five o'clock by the laudes or the lords. It's um, named after these psalms which are sung there, 148 to 45, 50 because those psalms in Latin begin all with laudate. They are sung there. And the canticum, that's a, a, a certain major song there. All of some of these hours have the cantica. Uh, this is the Benedictus, which is the canticum of Zacharias. Then we go uh, have the so-called lesser hours. That's the prime, the terse, the sex, and then known, the nona hour. So. They are smaller, they are not so elaborated. And then we have more or less the, on the other side in the evening, the Vespers. And that you will hear tonight, a Vesper office, uh, which is around s five o'clock or six o'clock. And we have the Magnificat, that's one of the major songs there. Then we have Complain, that's the last hour before going to sleep. It's maybe around six o'clock in the afternoon and we have the Canticum Nunc Dimittis of Simeon. Then you sleep and you wake up again at two o'clock. So, and then the circle goes further. So also time, 
perceiving of time is not our modern time, which has a physical structure going into future. In middle evil times, time is a spiritual time. It's, it's in God, it is a circular time. It never goes straight because the end of time is defined by God, but not by man. So, so shortly the office elements, only summary, let's know. We normally start with an opening, Deus in adiutorium meum intende, God help me, hasten to help me. Or uh, Domine labia mea aperias, that's another opening, Lord open my lips. And that's also very human because if you stand up at two o'clock, you can really pray, Lord open my lips, because I can't sing. <laughs> Then uh, we have all the psalms, in, in the Western tradition we have 150 psalms in a week normally, during office, we have antiphones, responsory hymns, and orationes and lectiones. So that, uh, we have no orationes and lectiones tonight, we only sing the, the musical items. Now, uh, if you uh, attended my last online lecture, I talked about this Hirsau Abbey in, in the Black Forest in Germany, which was destroyed and which was once uh, one of the biggest churches north of the Alps. And one of our ideas is to reconstruct this church. Um, I showed you already also this point cloud rec reconstruction. So we have already the model and we want to make acoustical experiments, but that's not today. <laughs> uh, just to give you, first we have to know what we will sing there, so the f we have to reconstruct the music, and fortunately we have um, a so-called Liber Ordinarius from Hirsau, which means uh, it's a, a book that regulates what is to sing when and where. And luckily we have also uh, from this Liber Ordinarius an online digital edition was made, so we can identify what we should sing for Vespers, for example, tonight, which items, and later on we can link it by linked open data from this digital edition to the reconstructed virtual model, and that will be uh, a big advantage. That's only what we will do for our project. It's not tonight and in during this summer course. But what I want to show you is where we find the music and where we sing. Because from Hirsau, uh, from this abbey, we have only, not only the church was destroyed, also the manuscripts were destroyed and scattered. But we have some fragments around. So for example, this one, is in the library of Stuttgart, in the Württembergische Landesbibliothek. And it's a, s a, a small excerpt of the songs of Vespers. As you see, it's notated on a clef system with clefs and lines. So we can read the pitches, more or less. Um, I've marked some of those, what you can see, uh, the antiphones, vitam petiit or hic accipiet, is the pauper. There are words missing, so we have to find the rest. So uh, we had it yesterday also, yeah? We won't stop where it ends because that's silly. <laughs> we won't, we'll reconstruct the missing melody and words. Okay, just to give you an idea how it is notated, and now, I want, want, uh, would like to give you some very basic ideas of uh, chorus of Gregorian chant singing. It all starts with more or less a simple recitation. It's on, on one single note. Dominus vobiscum et cum spiritus tuo, spirito tuo. Then we have uh, some ideas how to flex the melody, so, and that's a, uh, very similar to what Achilleus have uh, told, uh, shown us. For example, we have something what they call flexa, uh, which I've uh, marked in red. And you see, uh, at a comma, for example, we can bend this recitation tone to a semitone below. 
So we start uh, Oremus, Pretzis, um, Nost uh, I can't see it from here, I have to go here. Um, Atque apicatorum vinculis absolutis ab omninus adversitate custodi. So I, I just go down. So, or um, we have a metrum, which is called, which is more or less at a major uh, stop within a sentence. So we have a spiritu ideus, da da da. It's a third, for example. Um, or other, we have also a punctum, which is uh, when the text is really at the end. So I think that's a very similar concept which we, we already heard from, from the previous lecture. And what we will start tonight with this Deus in Adjutorium. And here you see a transcription in so-called square notation, so uh, it's readable. Yeah? And uh, it's, it's one of those very simple openings, so uh, mainly a recitation, uh, just some nuances of bending. It's very uh, appropriate if you stand up at two o'clock to begin with this. Yeah? So I will ask my singers maybe to, to come here and we will perform very shortly this opening, which you will hear also tonight. Okay. So normally the abbot starts by opening. So I that now I'm the abbot. So <laughs> Deus in adjutorium meum intende. Gloria patri et filio et spiritui sancto. Okay, you have, I think you can grasp the ma main, uh, how it works. Uh, Alleluia, that's an opening, we are in some feast time. So tonight we have some feast. I don't <laughs> uh, okay, then we have um, certain melodic uh, structures for reciting the Psalms. Uh, and we have tonus, which is the system we took over in Western Latin Church from the Byzantine or Eastern Church, the octo echas. Um, but the, the modes are not the same, so it, it has the same notes, uh, uh, names. But And we have some of this, um, I've put here the first tone, for example, and this are, uh, it's just to remember how it works, there is a, a didactic text. It says, sic incipitur, et sic flectitur, et sic mediator, atque sic finitur. It is self-describing. It says, like this it begins, like this you make the flexa, like this you make the mediatio, and like this it will end. Yeah? So you can, uh, of course you have to learn this by heart, and then if you have each melody, you can simply adapt a psalm. So if you know, Sic incipitur et sic flectitur et sic mediatur atque sic finitur. And the end has several, you can adapt it. So you see there are many endings. Or atque sic finitur, atque sic finitur, atque sic finitur, and so on. Yeah? You have many choices. So, uh, perhaps to give you an idea how this works applied to a real psalm, this was only for didactic pers uh, purpose, but now we, it, we take uh, a psalm here that's 112, and we, we maybe only sing um, the first three or something, that, that just to make the principle clear, only the psalm. Who was soloist in that? Uh, myself, okay. <laughs> mm. Laudate pueri dominum, laudate nomen domini. Sit nomen domini benedictum, 
ex hoc nunc et usque in seculum. And so on. In this modern edition, it's a modern chant book. Uh, in the to help the singers, you might see. Oh, it's not very sharp, but you might see in the text there are syllables bold and italic that helps to find the appropriate. But they have to adapt it because it's flexible. There are more syllables, less syllables. In medieval times, of course, you had to learn this by heart. You never had this notation. That's. So we are here now at the modes, and if you open a textbook, uh, very often you find something like that. That's Dorian, that's Phrygian, and so on. And it looks, and perhaps the text says that are the white uh, clef uh, on, the, on the piano. So that's absolutely not a mode. <laughs> it's not uh, a scale. That's absolutely wrong. That doesn't. It's the material, but it's it has nothing to do with the concept of mode. I've put uh, a quote of uh, Adam von Fulda, which is rather late in the 15th century, but he gives a nice example how the modes were uh, um, connected with a spiritual meaning. He says, omnibus est primus, the first most is for everyone or for anything. Set est alter tristibus aptus, but the other, the second mode, is for those to her um, um, sad. Thank you. Tertius iratus, the third is for the angry ones. Quartus dicitur fieri blandus, the fourth is for those adapted who are very bold. Quintum da latis, the fifth you give those who are happy. Afterwards we will sing in fifth mode, so you will be happy after that. Sextum pietate probatis, the sixth is for those which are very strong in faith and piety. Septimus est juvium, the seventh is for the young, for the youth. And the, the other, the eighth, is for the sapientium, for those who are very wise. So This is only one concept. Um, of how in medieval times and until the 17th or 18th century, also with uh, then with nature and uh, with the tonality, um, it's not neutral where you're singing. It has a spiritual or other feeling where you sing if you select a mode. And the earliest witnesses in the Western theory. Uh, here you see that they adapt the Greek system and for, uh, also the Greek uh, norm, uh, names. Because um, the Carolingians, as I said in my previous lecture, online lecture, they were very akin to adapt everything that was ancient and Greek. That was after the Pope, Greek was the second god of the Carolingians. So, um, they, the oldest is to call them protus, deuterus, tritus, tetraldus, and to uh, make a pair of authenticus plagalis, authenticus plagalis. Only later on they are uh, called by their uh, ordinal number, first tone, second tone. So you see the, the tradition is uh, still very Greek. And here another example, because we talked about Systema Teleion and all the things. This is Hukbald of Saint Amand, a scholar who was working in nowadays uh, and living in France or in Belgium today. And he wrote Musica de Harmonica Institutione. You see around the end of the ninth century, and that's a manuscript which is now preserved in the library of Saint Gaul, the famous library. And that's just one page where he tries to adapt the Systema Teleion for the tonal system of the modes. The, the Carolingian tried to understand what was meant by, re by interpreting Boesius, for example. And I, I don't know if you can read, but there is proslambanomenos at the top. 
and then Hypate, Hypaton, and so weiter. There are the, all the Greek names. And in between, there are written tonus, semitonus. So he tries to r interpret for them Lat Latin readers what yeah. they should understand, how they should understand. And he also makes these half circles saying this is a diapente, diatessaron, and so on, diapason, fifth. I don't want to go into detail, it's very complicated for, for specialists, but it's very interesting because at the end he arrives by more or less misinterpreting the whole system. So uh, the, the uh, Western church modes, they keep the tetrachord, but they shift it. So we don't have the typical antique tetrachord, but the idea is still there. So. And this is another testimony, a so-called tonery, where uh, the, the songs which are sung in service are grouped, not how they appear in the church calendar, but according to their mode. That's a tonnery. And one of the oldest is of Saint Riquier, end of the eighth century, very early, now in the Bibliothèque Nationale. And you see, it starts with Authentus Protus, and then come all the songs that are in that mode. Then Blai, Protus, which means Plagus, Authentus, Deuteros, and so on. So that's a grouping. Um, and that's another very interesting document, which is also in St. Gaul and comes also from, from the uh, monastery of St. Gaul, so-called Codex, Codex Hartke, written by a monk called Hartke. He lived around the year 1000 in St. Gaul, and at the incipit of his treatise, uh, and, and his, it's an antiphonary for the, for the office, he gives us also the modes uh, and how they are grouped and also how they were learned by the novices, by the children when they came into the monastery. You see, I hope, um, above here in red, seculorum amen. If you already remember this, because we will return in a second to this by, by singing yourself the syllables. Seculorum Amen. And below you see Noeane, written there. I don't have a pointer, but uh, this N in the middle on the right, you can see perhaps that means Noeane. That's one of those. Uh, memora formulas by where you can memorize a mode in a very condensed way. They are very short. It's just, and that's what you call the epimacha, uh, to intonate the mode. And now we will start with singing. All of you are invited yeah, to um, don't try um, with a very easy uh, Noe Noeane formula, formula for the fifth mode, which make you happy, okay? Uh, we take... Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, it's good. Noe Noeane, Noe Noeane. It's not very complicated. I sing again. Noe Noe. Will we try all together with all of those who are here singers? They will help you. No, 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 yeah. Okay, there were some mistakes, so you have to come before the abbot and be punished. No. I think again. No, 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 once again, no, 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 perfect. Thank you. That's a, a very short formula to it. No, 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 it doesn't make much sense. It's 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 um, only the syllables so vowels. So no, oea. So it, it helps you to. Um, it maybe it sounds I chose this because it is very easy because it's more or less major mode. It is very s close to our major scale. So uh, another element I wanted to show you is about the um, flexibility of the voice in singing. 
and we talked about quarter tones and all the things and Achilleas showed us that the singers in the Byzantine tradition, they don't make uh, discrete pitches, but they make ornaments and so on. And we can trace this tradition also in the neums, in the so-called neums of the Western tradition. I've written, I've on the slide you see a, an offer, the beginning of the Offertorium Elegerunt Apostoli from the Abbey of Einsiedeln in Switzerland. Above it is written in neums, in so-called adiastematic neums. So here you have to know the melody by heart before, as you said. Later on it was transcribed in square notation. So you can read, if you can, the clef and read square notation, you more or less can sing it without knowing the melody, because you have the pitches. <laughs> what I wanted to show you is first you see the neumes, which are these strokes and all these signs, but above they are written also letters. And this is, is a special um, means uh, developed in the uh, tradition of St. Gaul in South Germany, uh, like to the border of South Germany, now Switzerland. Um, they give indications for the singers who know the melody, but there are certain points where they have to pay attention. So, for example, the first uh, note, which is if you look on the transcription, it's a C. And if you look on the neumes, there is a little stroke at the beginning, and on the left, a little above, is an I written, which means usus, which means low. Uh, so it wants the singer, don't start with D, because probably the mode would start with a D. Pay attention, it goes with a deeper note at the beginning, but immediately it is um, another attention, M, above, mediocrite, but not so much deep. Hmm? Don't go a third or something, only a second, so be cautious. Um, or L, levate, at this third here, you have to go up with the voice. And E in between, there are equal tones. So this is these two Fs here, that is the same tone. Yeah? And so it's very rich decorated. So um, that is for uh, how the voice has to fit the pitches. But we have also uh, letters that indicate which we, where we don't know what it really means today, how they did it. For example, the F above, in the very above here, the F, which means cum fragore. Um, well, very strong or noisy or something like this. But how do you sing that? We, we, we don't know. It's ma many of them are enigmatic. And another thing, um, on the very right, you see this no, no, Siri starts again. I don't know how it is triggered. <laughs> I didn't say Siri. <laughs> okay. Um, this curves, three curves, yeah, almost uh, on the, the second from the right. Yeah? This is so-called quilisma, which has still a, a Greek um, meaning. Also here, we don't know what it really meant in performing. We have some theorists, they say it's a tremble of the voice. We don't know how to realize it. Most uh, singers from Gregorian chant today in the Western tradition, they simply omit this sign. Um, you, have, you see it here written in the transcription on the lines, but it has some, obviously, uh, it was something which couldn't be uh, transcribed precisely in the system of lines, because the intervals were in between. They couldn't fix it somewhere. So we started uh, in, in our scholar and in my other ensembles. I, I think we can't omit the signs, because it gives an artificial difference between Gregorian chant and, for example, Byzantine chant. B it makes the difference bigger, because, as Achillea said, we sing only steps. 
And, but at some points, at least, there are signs that indicate that the singers did something else like you do. Maybe something like Apostolos. We don't know. Yeah? Um, we have to reinvent a tradition. And uh, you will hear tonight, we will apply it to certain pieces. And just to show you on, an, on a song, which, on a chant which we sing tonight, um, you see the quillisma here in the second line on the left. You see this uh, mea on mea. There you see one of those notes. Al also in Hirsau, in this monastery, they had these signs. So there was still a tradition for um, Manum servum mea, something like this, perhaps. Yeah. Um, there is also on servus. There is a oriscus. There is. It's a very, uh, very delicate stroke, uh, which may be also. A, it's an ornamental sign. So, in venida servum. Instead of servum, it might be servum, something like this. To, to find the tradition, it's, it's very uh, inspiring to hear to other traditions who already still have this uh, way of singing without only copying them. There was uh, an ensemble, Marcel Perez has done this with his ensemble Organum, but uh, they have more or less, they sing now, we they have adapted or copied the Byzantine tradition. So I don't think that's the solution. You have to find your own way, just. So now it's again to up to you for the last time of my talk. We will um, learn a little bit. Do you remember Seculorum Amen on the, on the slide, which I've told you? Uh, that's the last part of the so-called lesser doxo doxology. Um, which finishes the end of every psalm, it is added. Gloria Patri et Filio, et Spiritui Sancto. And the second, the answer is, Sicut erat in principio et nunc et semper, et in secula seculorum. Amen. Okay? So we will first try to remember the text. Yeah. To make it more difficult, I do it away. So... Um, so that you just trust your memory, okay. Sicut erat in principio, et nunc et semper, et in secula seculorum. Amen. So we will divide it in three parts, so that's it not so difficult for everyone. Uh, let's say here one, middle, and from left wing, okay. So you, on the right, you have... Sicut erat in principio, in the middle, et nunc et semper, et in secula, seculorum, and all together, amen. Okay? We will try. So, se, uh, sicut erat in principio. Sicut erat in principio, et nunc et semper, et in secula, Seculorum. Amen. Perfect. <laughs> Once again. Sicut erat in principio. Et nunc et semper. Et in secula. Seculorum. Amen. Okay. Now, I think you are already fit to, to, met, to get the melody also, which is, a, which is the Noe Noeane. Uh, by the way, do you remember how Noe Noeane was working? <laughs> no? Is there still someone? Noe Noeane. Do we repeat? Noe Noeane. Sicut erat in principio, et nunc et semper, et in secula seculorum. Amen. 
that's the most easy part, okay? <laughs> okay, I repeat again to listen. First part. Si cut erat in principio et nunc. Uh, I'm sorry. Okay, no that. Si cut erat in principio. Si cut erat in principio et nunc et semper. Et nunc et semper. Et in secula seculorum. Et in secula seculorum. Amen. Very good. Thank you. Once again, and then we will, for the, to finish, we will, the singers will come again and we will uh, do it at the end of the Magnificat, so you have the sense. And you are invited tonight, when we sing this piece and you are in the audience, that you will join us with this Seculorum Amen. And um, we will do it once again. Sicut erat. Sicut erat in principio, et nunc et semper, et in secula seculorum. Amen. So, now the next difficulty is maybe when do you have to sing at the right moment? Yeah? That you come too late <laughs> and you have to be punished, okay? Um, that's very easy, and now we do something uh, which is, for the monks, it was a sign of veneration, but it was also to see if you are far away and you wonder when you have to enter, you see it because they make something at the doxology which you can see. Before, we have Gloria Patri et Filio, and they bow down, so... Gloria Patri et Filio et Spiritui Sanctus. And then, Sicut Erat in Principio, you go back. Okay? So, to finish, I invite you, and to be more energetic, to stand up once at your seat. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And now, uh, the Scola will sing the Gloria Patri before, the first before, and at the beginning, if you hear Gloria and you see the singers go down, you follow them, okay? And if you go back, that's the sign that you have to sing Sicut Erat in Principio, okay? So. <laughs> Gloria Patri, you can start the singer's part, please, with Gloria Patri, and give us a chance to follow you <laughs> by make a veneration. Okay. And we go back. And that's the sign. Si cut erat in principio, et nunc et semper, et in secula seculorum. Amen. Perfect. So in the concert you might not stand in that group, so you are invited to sing all together at that point. Okay? It's the second last piece of our performance, so I, I will give you a sign to join us, okay? Thank you, you can sit down. And my last slide um, is just to show you, maybe um, you look like this. this. Uh, so if we wonder how singers were performing in the Middle Ages, that's a very interesting ivory carving now in Cambridge, and um, and I have made, uh, you see a, a, a cleric, and around him is our standing singers. Huh? And I have, it's so detailed, I've, I've zoomed out this carving of ivory, and if you can see the details, I don't know if it's sharp enough, there's, ah, oh, C triggers, uh, okay. You can see even the teeth of the singers and how they make their mouth. So you could even fancy 
if you study this, man, this carving, if they are singing the vowel A, ah, no? and that might, because the first song, the first chant in the church here, in the Western church, it's the beginning of, uh, beginning of First Advent, that's uh, the, the beginning of the new church here, and it starts with the introitus, a te levavi anima mea, to, up to you I lift myself. And maybe because every liturgical manuscript is starting with an initial big A to start a church here, and maybe the carver has here um, integrated this, how the, he has observed how the monks were singing. So maybe we could here investigate historical vocal production in a, in a monument coming from the time around the tenth, late 10th century. Okay, that's my last slide to keep in time. I've kept it flexible. And um, I hope you are all there tonight and help us with the secular mom. Thank you. So Anastasia has uh, had to join a, a meeting. But uh, so I, I tell myself, if you, if you have questions, you could probably ask now. <laughs> Thank you very, very much for this uh, lecture of yours. It's been really interesting. Um, just want to make a reflection more than a question, which is um, when I showed you yesterday the heptatony in ancient Greek system and how it, um, both tetrachords shared that middle note I, I wrote in red, um, think of it in, in later times as a cantillation uh, tone in this modal system to which the voice has to go back when it sings because it's the main note of the modal uh, music and that's a reflection I want to make because it's very important that we keep in mind that all this music belongs to a tradition and something as you said which is for me extremely interesting is how the um, um, uh, Charlemagne and his court I suspect, and that's a private idea again, I suspect that polyphony into the Western world in music arrived through his court, from uh, Byzantine courts, because they sent uh, singing masters to him so that they could learn what music was like in the Eastern uh, churches. So I always have suspected that when polyphony arrives in Notre Dame in Paris, uh, it has something to do with the Greek tradition of how to make music, how to perform music. And that's all I wanted to say. Thank you very, very much. It's been really interesting. Thank you. Um, at least um, to add to this, um, the earliest manuscript in the West reflecting organum, the earliest um, uh, polyphony of making uh, are from almost the same time where the chant, the monophonic chant is. So it obviously came at the same time. So uh, Musica in Hiriadis, it's one of these very early treatises which was written, there are various opinions, but uh, at the end or middle of the ninth century, which is more or less earlier than the earliest chant manuscripts. So there should be, it's not later, it came at the same time somehow. So. I think all of this uh, is fascinating. Um, this organum parallelum, which is made in fourths, as we all know, uh, is documented in Plutarch as well, because he says, Plutarch says in, in Greek, uh, that um, uh, playing for someone who was singing could be done a fourth underneath the voice. Krusmata uh, apotesaron. Uh, which is really interesting because that, I think, it should prove that polyphony was used in ancient times and it was used in the same way as the organum parallelum we find in the very first uh, codes. Sorry, I stopped talking. Thank you very much. Okay. Are there any other questions to everyone?
everything is clear? Okay, thank you. Then uh, I think Areti is next now. Okay. Thank you. So um, we're going to keep it very um, brief uh, on the protocol for today at the church. I'm just going to give you a very, very quick overview. And we're going to go over the things that we will do there in detail in the church while we're setting up so everything makes more sense. Um, so let's go over those things in the procedure first, then we'll spend a few minutes talking about the projects and the groups, and we'll be uh, done. So what we want to do today is actually, and I have, I don't know. So that's what the church looks like. It's a rather old, but very small church in the city center. And actually, yep, we got it. There is the main building, which is outlined in dark gray. And everything you see in light gray is things that sort of either don't exist anymore or they were added later and removed. So there are additional spaces around the church uh, utility spaces, let's say. Um, so 
it's a rather small church, and what we are trying to capture is the acoustic imprint of this space um, in order to a analyze it and uh, try to draw some conclusions on the things that make the sound and the acoustics in this church unique or different from any other church, A, and B, to be able to use some of those uh, that information um, to recreate virtually the sound of this church, outside of this church. So to do a simplified version of, uh, of what you've uh, heard with uh, the sound of Hagia Sophia that you, you've heard, I believe, in one of the virtual uh, courses that we had a couple of weeks ago. Um, so in order to be able to study or actually rather recreate the acoustics of a space, we need to um, reduce its whole physical uh, existence into a set of parameters. And uh, there are several ways one can go about deriving those parameters. Uh, one would be to actually virtually or physically model this space. Um, virtually model this space on a computer, create an architectural 3D model of this space, and then there is software that allow you to actually study how sound behaves in this space. Um, and this is a practical um, approach, and it's uh, an approach that's normally being used for spaces that have not been built yet. So if you're trying to build a theater, you want to have a, an idea of how it sounds like before you build it. Otherwise, it gets very expensive to actually fix it. So, um, but if the space exists, there are things that you can do inside this space. So you can go and acoustically measure the behavior of this space. Um, and the thing that we know, and it is something that, um, it's, it's a knowledge that we have as an experience, but we don't necessarily realize it, is that not all sounds behave the same in a space. We can be in the same space and certain sounds or certain instruments or certain types of audio signal speech versus music, for example, might sound good or if acceptable or bad. And the space stays the same, but the use of the space, or otherwise the signal that travels through the space changes. So in order to be able to characterize a space, you need to be able to actually get an idea of how it sounds, regardless of what the thing that sounds in it is. So you need to be able to actually study how all sounds, essentially, would behave in this space. And there are specific types of sounds that you can actually, from the beginning, dismiss and say, OK, obviously, if I put a noise machine or if I put a, I don't know, a motorcycle in this room and it starts making noise, this uh, space is not the most convenient space to experience the sound of a motorcycle. It won't be enjoyable. But um, for different types of sound, like music or speech, etc., uh, it might not be that intuitive. There might be things in the way the room looks like that might, may make you think that, OK, this room might be suitable for music. It kind of looks like a theater, like this physical room that we are in now. It looks like other theaters that I have been into, so why not? And if you study this space, it might at the end of it, it turned out that it's not the most suitable space for music, even though it might look like one. So um, the goal is to actually study uh, a room, study the behavior of a room throughout the full, what we say, frequency range and dynamic range of sound. So from the very low frequencies to the highest possible frequencies perceived by the human ear, in various levels of energy, from very soft to very loud, to be able and prepared to say how a room would behave if we put a certain type of sound signal in. And this is what we will do in this church. So we have this, yep. we have this church, and it's a rather small church. 
Um, so when we go inside, we will fill at least half of it, if not more, in terms of seats for the concert. And it will be mostly us. Um, it's a small space, and it is an or Orthodox church. So we think it's designed to actually um, promote listening to speech and listening to sung music. Not instrumental music is not part of the culture of Greek Orthodox, the Greek Orthodox Church, but sounds and speech, yes, this is how we deliver, this, this religion delivers its message. So it should be a church that is optimized to actually deliver these types of signals really well. So the first thing we want to do is actually look at that and determine whether it is a good construction, if it was constructed the way it was supposed to. Um, and the, the second thing we want to do is actually get that information, whatever that is, good or bad, and be able to apply it in any situation and say, okay, now we want to have a piano playing in this church, or we want to have a guitar playing in this church, or, I don't know, we want to bring um, a huge screen and have a movie viewing in this church. Can we? What would it sound like? So what we will actually do is this, and I will explain. We will pop balloons in this church. Be prepared to pop approximately 20 balloons in this church. We will pop some balloons in the beginning to set up the levels of the mics so that they don't peak. And then we will start popping balloons to actually get an idea of how the church, what it sounds like. And the question is, why This is a bird eye view of the church. So we see it from the top. And the church that we will be measuring, the main church, is the dark gray thing. Okay, everything else is out of limits. So we will be popping balloons in different positions within those dark gray uh, area. And uh, the reason we will be doing that is that um, we want to study how sound behaves in this church, and we want to study how any sound from very low to very high frequency pitch sound sounds like in this church. And the theory of audio says that the audio signal that contains pretty much all frequencies is noise. So noise is a signal that has frequencies from very low to very, very high. And because those frequencies are random and they don't have a fixed relationship, they don't have a pitch, they don't sound like music, they sound like crap, it's noise, but it's what we need to actually characterize this space. Popping balloons is a way of creating noise. But we can create noise in several other ways. We can create noise with our mouths. We can create noise by clapping our hands. Why popping balloons? Because we want not only to create noise, we could bring a speaker, but we need to carry that, and nobody wants to carry a speaker. If you want to carry a balloon, I mean, balloon speaker, yeah. The popping of the balloon creates a blast of energy, and that energy is high enough to allow the sound to travel throughout the space. We don't only need the noise to be created. I can create noise here by my mouth, but it will never be loud enough to travel throughout this space. We want it to be loud enough, because if it's loud enough, it has the power to travel. And it has the power to travel all around the space. And it can then interact with the walls, it can reflect, it can travel around, and it will, what we say, excite the full space of interest. 
So we will be popping balloon in several positions and we will be recording in several other positions. Where will we be popping balloons from and where will we be recording at? We will be popping balloons from places in the church where you will customly find a sound source. Like, where will, be, where will the priest be standing in this church talking if they, they would not have a microphone? Because now with microphones, it becomes irrelevant. You can be anywhere, you can talk and you can be heard anywhere, but we're talking natural sound projection now. We're not looking at speakers and microphones in a church. We're looking at the natural sound scene. We will be popping balloon from the positions that we would normally have people creating sound. And that would be in the very front here, where you would normally in any church have the main priest standing, preaching. So the balloon will take the role of the priest but instead of speaking at a steady frequency range of the human voice, it will be creating sound in all frequencies and loud enough to travel everywhere. So then we can substitute the essence of a priest with any other sound source, that's the idea. We will also probably, most likely, put a second sound source towards the right here, where it is the custom position of uh, the people who are chanting. We have the priest in the center and then Chanting in the Greek Orthodox Church happens from the left and right. Uh, you have this uh, discussion between these two groups of people singing. And uh, the right side is where the main preaching comes from, from the chants. And the left side is the, the chant that, that actually responds, is the response to the main idea. So you have this dialogue, but the heavy message of the dialogue comes from the right. So where you want to be is on the right side. You want to be on the people delivering the message, not the people responding. But yeah, okay. So uh, we will be popping balloon from those two main positions, the priest and the main, the primary uh, person from the choir singing. Where, we, where will we be recording at? We will be recording at several places inside the church where you would normally have people either sitting or standing. So this eating area is rather small, is this one. And we have columns inside the church, so it's even harder. There's blockages of the inside. And we have standing in the back. So the idea is to have two sources and we will record approximately six different positions in here either sitting or standing, which means that we will have a microphone recording the popping of the balloon in six different spaces. We will pop a balloon from the main area here. Actually, we will pop two or three balloons to have a repetition. Then we'll take the microphone, we'll move it to the next position. We will repeat the idea. We will have to blow approximately 20 balloons. Be prepared. That's going to be fun. So we will be recording one or two positions, six measurement positions, two or three balloons per position. It's going to take us about an hour of blowing balloons and popping them and, you know, it's going to be interesting. Once we have this information, we can then do a couple of things. One, we can analyze it using software to get an idea of different parameters that describe the acoustics of this space. Um, the most known one, the one that we normally talk about is the reverberation of a space. You can get an idea of the reverberation of the space, uh, but there are more parameters that people actually nowadays look like, like clarity, which is a parameter that actually tells you how clean, sharp a sound is, uh, depending on you know successive uh, messages that come one after the other. So for example, if we're talking music, Clarity and definition are parameters that describe how clear you can hear one note from the successive from a successive note. If you're talking speech, how clear you hear one syllable from the next, from what's coming. So if you have, it's not only an effect of reverberation when you don't understand speech. It's an effect of other parameters that are affecting this blending of, of sound, for example. Um, so we can have those parameters and we can analyze and we can draw a conclusion about how effective the construction of this church was for the purpose that it was built, which was the Greek Orthodox 
uh, it's, it was a Greek Orthodox church. And then we can also draw conclusions on other potential usages of that, that church that could be effective. That was, that's one thing. And the other thing that's more fun is following the, the measurements that we will do, we will have a concert in this church, which will be recorded regularly recorded you will see we'll have technicians there they'll set up microphones and they will record the two groups of people syncing together and uh, apart so we will have an idea of what choirs sound like in this church then we can take this as a reference we can have the responses from the room the recordings that we have and we can use those to actually force any sigla signal that we have that does not have its own reverberation. So any signal that was recorded either in an anechoic room or in a studio even, that it was recorded in a sound treated space. And we can force it to sound as if it was coming from this church to see what the result would be. So on Thursday and Friday, we will record some excerpts from the two groups that will be playing today in the concert in the studio. So we will have more dry signals of what they did. And I'm going to show you on Friday the process of actually uh, forcing the, the, acoustic the acoustics of the uh, Capnicaria space on those recordings. And we can compare that to the recording of the church during the concert. Of course, it's not going to be exactly the same because during the concert we'll have a lot of people, be a little bit more noisy. But excluding that, we will get an idea of you know, what it would sound like. Um, so that's what we will be doing today. And we will have very little time to do that. We'll have to be focused. Uh, that the time in the schedule that says that you can be in the church is 5.30, 5, I believe, according to the schedule. We will be there starting to carry equipment and starting to set up cables, etc., at 4.30. So anyone who wants to be part also of the real tech thing and not just the measurements, you're more than welcome to arrive at the church 30 minutes earlier and join the tech crew of the university who will be setting up the cables and all the, the equipment. And at five, we will be starting the measurement process with the balloons. We'll have about an hour to finish that. And that's not a lot of time. And uh, after that, the setup will change. And I'll tell you a little bit about the setup of the recording. It's a regular setup for recording choirs in churches, but I'll tell you a little bit about it there. When it happens, the setup will change. The tech crew will set up the recording of the, of the choirs, and then the, the two choirs will come and will start recording the samples. That is the plan for today. But we have to be there. If you're not there at 4.30, if you're not interested at the tech part, please be there at 5. The, the thing is, once we start measuring, it's a very noisy space. We'll have the doors closed. If you're stuck outside, you have to wait between measurements to get in. It's not, it's going to be a process that requires some sort of a, a management between us because it's a lot of us and we create noise and noise is something that we don't need during those measurements. Um, so I don't know if you have any questions about the process. I'll have the maps and everything and while we're doing that, I will be explaining, but uh, if you need any, if there's anything that you need to know now, Yes, but we just decided that the uh, choirs will start coming at 6 and we'll start recording the choirs at 6. So we'll run some demo um, recordings of the choirs syncing before the audience comes in. Because the more people we have in the church, the more the acoustic imprint of the church changes. And we cannot run measurements with full people because that would be too noisy. So uh, we have an hour to run this thing. Then we will be running other types of measurements, but recordings, not acoustic measurements. Now, we will start recording at 6.30, which means you will start arriving a little bit before that, which means we have to finish by 6, and we have to change the setup from the measurements to the recording. So that's why I say we have an hour to actually do the recording, the, the, the measurements. It will take some time to actually collect the cables from the measurements, set up the microphones for the recording, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I think that's, uh, to be on the safe side, we do an hour. For uh, what? F 
for uh, capturing, for recording the balloon popping. For analysis, yes, we will use, um, I will show you, we will use a software that's called REW. You can download it, it's free, it's open source. It's uh, for any type of uh, operating system, REW. And uh, you actually input the impulse response is what it is what we are recording. You input the recording signal and you get some uh, reviews. I will give you a brief overview on Friday. It's actually a rather technical software, but I will give a demonstration. I will show you the results directly. So, all cool with that? 4.30 if you're interested in seeing how the setup will run for the measurements. You know where the church is. And uh, five o'clock we start measurement, so don't be stuck outside. It's already a very noisy space outside. I don't know if you've been there. There's musicians playing, etc. So it's gonna make our life <laughs> a bit difficult. Okay. So we'll see you at 4:35. There. Bye. <laughs>